Last time, we covered the subject of who killed who in Scream 1, and you guys turned up for that. So naturally, we gotta follow that up now with the sequel. Which means in this video, we'll be taking an in-depth look at the Windsor College Massacre of Scream 2 to find out when Ghostface was Mickey and when it was Mrs. Loomis. What is up Scream Team, Zach Cherry here. Guys, I started this channel because I'm a huge horror geek and if you're like me, you might want to consider hitting that subscribe button and turning on those bell notifications so you can stay up to date with all my latest videos. Just for shits and gigs, toss this video a thumbs up and let me know in the comments down below who you think was killed by Mickey and who you think was killed by Mrs. Loomis. Scream 2 was released less than a year after the original and was plagued by a rushed production which was wrought with script leaks that resulted in numerous rewrites of the film. As a safeguard moving forward, the script pages that revealed the killer's identities were only provided to the actors involved on the day the scene was shot, which meant that as far as the cast were aware, any of them could have been the killer. So while Wes Craven was very meticulous in his plotting and direction of Matthew Lillard and Skeet Ulrich in the original, he wasn't really afforded that luxury this time around. For that reason, some of this breakdown is going to be more conjectural than analytical. So with that in mind, please understand that these are just my personal personal observations and are in no way meant to be taken as fact. Our story picks up approximately two years after the events of the Woodsboro Massacre. Sydney and Randy, who I'm totally shipping as rancid, have moved on with their lives and are now attending Windsor College in the state of Ohio, where they study theater and film, respectively. Gail has become a best-selling author with even better hair and Dewey is dewier than ever. Someone who hasn't moved on with their life though is Billy's mother, Nancy Loomis, named as an homage to the actress who played Annie in the original Halloween. We don't ever find out Mrs. Loomis's real first name on screen, but supposedly it was given as Nancy in a very early first draft script, so I'm gonna roll with it. Distraught by the death of her son at the hands of Gail and Sydney, Mrs. Loomis hatches an elaborate revenge scheme that begins with using her alimony to get a facelift and liposuction. With her new makeover, she begins scouring the internet looking for a serial killer protege, which she finds in Mickey Altieri. She ingratiates herself to Mickey by offering to finance his college tuition where he'll get to carry out a copycat crime spree of the original Woodsboro murders with the promise of gaining infamy through the ensuing trial. Mrs. Loomis also sets out to create a fake identity for herself in the form of Debbie Salt, a perky writer for the Post-Telegram. She also gets her first up-close encounter with Gail Weathers one year prior to the events of Scream 2 when she attends her seminar in Chicago. Now, similar to Billy and Stu, we can imagine that Mrs. Loomis and Mickey put a lot of time and effort into planning this murder spree, likely gathering information on Windsor College students in order to find the right victims that would fit a pattern. However, unlike Billy and Stu, these two had dramatically different agendas. While Mickey's motive was to go to trial and be exonerated through his Blame the Movies defense, Mrs. Loomis had no interest in killing anyone other than those directly responsible for her son's death. Because of that fact alone, this will paint the clearest picture of my rationale, but behind this breakdown. So starting off the night of the stab premiere, we find out that Phil and Maureen have obtained free passes to go see the movie. This is where I'm going to do a little creative scene building and presume that Phil was given these tickets by Mickey earlier that day. Obviously, it was a lucky break for the killers that they found two victims with the right names who also happened to be dating each other. But in order to then get these two together at the right time and in the right location would have required a little bit more finessing. So that's why I believe that Mickey had already established a connection with the victims. Otherwise, this whole scenario feels like a really lucky coincidence. With that said, Mickey is the one who enters the theater, waits for Phil in the restroom, and whispers, Billy, don't tell mommy what you did, giving us our first clue to the film's eventual big bad. After stabbing Phil in the head through the partition, he takes his jacket and returns to Phil's seat. Obviously, this had to be Mickey as well, as a woman of Mrs. Loomis' stature would have raised instant alarm bells for Maureen. Mickey then proceeds to stab Maureen seven times, as indicated later on, and quickly ducks out the emergency exit at the front of the theater before anyone realizes the gravity of the situation. Now, where is Mrs. Loomis during all of this, you ask? Well, she's waiting outside as the getaway driver. This can be surmised by the fact that later on in the film when Gail and Dewey see Mickey's footage 
damage. He's shooting Phil and Maureen from the passenger side window of a car that's just pulling up in front of the theater. I can't help but feel that it was a huge missed opportunity to not have included Timothy Oliphant as an extra in this scene. Seeing him in the background action getting out of a car and lining up for the movie would have been a nice detail that, well, I noticed on an initial viewing, would have made me so giddy to see on multiple rewatches. Moving on to the next night, while Cece takes on sober sister duties at the Omega Beta Zeta house, we get our first proper Ghostface phone call of the movie. I'm gonna go ahead and say that this is Mrs. Loomis calling. I base that mostly on the fact that Mickey is the one who sneaks into the house and murders Cece. We can even hear Ghostface talking on the phone at the same time we see this Ghostface enter the house. But since this one isn't holding a phone, this is our first clue that there's more than one killer in this movie. The phone calls aren't as big a factor here as they were in the original, but I still feel that the killer making the calls would be the one out of the two who's more in control of the plan. In this case, Mrs. Loomis, who probably couldn't have trusted Mickey to have done the job correctly on his own. Again, based on Mickey's footage we see later, we can tell that at least Mickey is hiding in the bushes outside of the house, and I suspect Mrs. Loomis would also be with him, as she would need to cue him at the right time to run inside. I know a lot of people credit Mrs. Loomis with Cece's murder, but I just don't buy it. We know that Mickey doesn't show up to the Delta Lambda party until after Cece is killed, so there's nothing to suggest that he wasn't present at the scene. And even given Sarah Michelle Gellar's petite stature at 5 foot for, I'm just not buying Lori Metcalf hoisting anyone up over a balcony. And as I mentioned with the motives earlier, Cece is inconsequential to Mrs. Loomis. As far as she's concerned, Cece is just collateral damage as part of her revenge scheme, and she wouldn't have had the determination or gusto in performing the murder herself. If anything, this was Mrs. Loomis's treat to Mickey, in order to satisfy his copycat murder hard on. With Mickey then meeting up with Derek and arriving at the party, Mrs. Loomis stays behind at Omega Beta Zeta, allowing her to be the first reporter on the scene, scooping Gail Weathers and then running off to meet her deadline. In reality though, she hurries over to the Delta Lambda house, which by this point has all but cleared out. We see Mickey walking away in the crowd, but again, I'm going to presume that he doubled back and retrieved his ghost face costume, which he probably had hidden in some bushes somewhere. With Sydney now as the only one left inside, Mrs. Loomis calls the house. Again, I'm going to say this is Mrs. Loomis calling based on the same reason I think Mrs. Loomis made all the calls in this movie, but also for the fact that she specifically says to Sydney, Remember me. Which suggests a history and personal connection. In any event, we get a weird transition where Ghostface goes from talking on the phone to then talking in person as he shows up behind her using the same infamous voice. However, this is now Mickey, who's just caught the tail end of Sydney's conversation with Mrs. Loomis. I know a lot of people think this is also Mrs. Loomis, but I call bullshit on that since the phone call would then have to be placed from the front porch and with Derek standing right there, he would have heard all of this. So I'm guessing Mrs. Loomis was hiding off to the side of the house. Now, for anyone questioning why the killer at the door would also be speaking in the same voice as the killer on the phone, we can see later on during Mickey's reveal that after he takes off the mask, he pulls the voice transformer out from the elongated mouth section. This lets us know that the device would easily fit into the mask and would be operational, allowing for the killer to also disguise their voice while moving around freely without a phone. After chasing Sydney through the house, Mickey is then accosted by Derek, who he slashes in the arm before taking off through the front door, just before Dewey and the sorority girls arrive. He then meets back up with Randy and Hallie before they're all taken in for questioning, where he uses Derek's bravado against him by planting seeds of doubt in Sydney's mind. At this point, it should be noted that since Mrs. Loomis's revenge plot includes two principal targets with both Sydney and Gail, she and Mickey would need to work independently of one another in order to cover more ground and gather the optimum amount of intel. That's why throughout most of the movie, we see that Mickey is a plant in Sydney's friend group while Mrs. Loomis poses as a member of the press in order to shadow Gale. For this reason, it is important that Mrs. Loomis had Mickey as a partner, since if she got too close to Sydney herself, she could have been exposed early on, and that would thwart her entire plan. So this should let us know that all of the Ghostface encounters with Sydney are Mickey, and all of the Ghostface encounters with Gale are Mrs. Loomis. This is also the point in the movie where we ultimately learn of the copycat pattern of the killer, which 
also happens to be abandoned just as soon as we find out about it. This has caused a lot of confusion in the Scream fandom for quite a while, but I think it can be summed up as part of Mrs. Loomis's scheme. She knew Gail well enough to know that she would catch on and wanted to switch things up in order to outsmart her and throw the investigators off their game. I'm sure she made up some bullshit reason to Mickey as to why they needed to abandon their MO and move up their schedule, but this was definitely part of her plan all along. Now, as much as Mickey is just a patsy in Mrs. Loomis's scheme, he does show himself to be a very industrious accomplice. And I am, of course, going to reference the cafeteria scene. You know, the scene that's the bane of every Scream 2 champion's existence. As much as it does suck, it sets up a few key components for us later on. Specifically, the climax of the movie. Which has always felt to me like a very lucky coincidence for the killers, having their plan culminate in the theater, with Derek having been indisposed by his fraternity brothers. But I think we can see here that Mickey saw an opportunity and jumped at it. Knowing that Derek has infringed on the rules outlined in his Omega Kappa Beta handbook, he schemes with the brothers, and sisters, in order to get Derek exactly where he needs him to be at the right time. Now, we don't actually see Mickey for the next 45 minutes of the film. However, in some deleted footage, we do find out that he, Derek, and Hallie have implemented a buddy system in order to keep Sydney safe throughout the day, each taking turns as her chaperone. This is why Sydney asks about Mickey's whereabouts when Derek shows up at the theater, as Mickey has switched shifts with him in order to stage the ghost face attack on her during the dress rehearsal, where he expertly blends in with the rest of the robed dancers, only to quickly run off unseen. While this is all going down, Mrs. Loomis hides in Joel's news van and calls Gail's phone, which is picked up by Randy instead. I can only imagine that her endgame here was to lure Gail back to the van, where she would have then murdered her. But fortunately for Gail, and unfortunately for Randy, things didn't go as planned. I can't really say for sure if Mrs. Loomis had intended to kill Randy based on some sort of revenge by survivor proxy, but we do know by her own admission that she got a little knife happy after he spoke poorly of Billy. This gives us the only kill of the movie, where one of the ghost faces actually takes credit for it, confirming to us that this is Mrs. Loomis. So there really isn't any need to defend this one. However, this is where things do get a little messy, as Ghostface in this movie is always shown to be left-handed. This isn't an accident, and most certainly was intentional on Wes Craven's part, just as he had done with the specific ways in which Billy and Stu each held their blade in the original Scream. Mickey is shown to be left-handed throughout the film. The only instance where he isn't is during the film class discussion, when he crumples up and throws the paper across the room. But I'm gonna chalk that up to the fact that this scene was actually a reshoot, and with the pressure of its rushed production, everyone probably just wanted to get the scene over with as quickly as possible, and forgot about continuity. We also see that Mickey holds his camcorder in his right hand, but this can be explained by the fact that most handheld cameras are only made with the strap on the right hand side. There is however a line of deleted dialogue that not only confirmed that the killer was left handed, but also that several of the characters were left handed as well, including Hallie, who was supposed to be the killer in an alternate draft of the script. And from the angle of the knife wounds, they know the killer's left handed. You're left handed, aren't you? <sighs> yes. I am. But look, Hallie is also left-handed. Conversely, we can also see that every scene in which Mrs. Loomis appears, she is shown to be right-handed. Now I say this because by that logic, every appearance by Ghostface in this movie should then indicate to us that it is Mickey underneath the mask, based on the killer always using his left hand. This would also make him responsible for every kill, including Randy's, who we can see that even though the killer appears to be using their right hand, this is a mirrored image, making this particular killing done by the left hand as well. But then we do have Mrs. Loomis admitting to killing Randy, so how does this make any sense? Well, quite simple. Mrs. Loomis is purposefully using her left hand, as she knows the forensic investigators will see that every murder had been committed by a left-handed person, and to have one victim show inconsistent knife wounds would clue the authorities in on a second possible killer. She even brags to Sydney later on about how she's going to get away with it, as everything is traceable back to Mickey. We also see her switch which hand she's holding the gun in as she gets ready to execute her. I can't prove that this is 100% factual, as Wes Craven is sadly no longer here to vouch for this himself, and there's no telling that any of these actors were privy to the minutia of these directions, or if they even remembered getting them. But if this was Wes Craven's intent, this is just more brilliant filmmaking and definitely on par with the attention to detail he gave to the first movie. 
After Randy's murder, Mickey slides into Sydney's DMs while she studies at the library. This would obviously have to be Mickey as only students have access to the computers, and with the killer having to use a terminal inside the library to send the messages, Mrs. Loomis wouldn't want to risk getting exposed by Sydney. Instead, she continues to skulk around police headquarters, where she's able to get close enough to the investigation to know that Sydney's being taken to a safe house later that night, and passes that information along to Mickey. Mickey trails Sydney and her bodyguard detail, where he intercepts the cop car at a traffic light, slitting Officer Andrew's throat and driving Officer Richards right into some roadside construction where he's impaled through the head. This of course puts a hamper on Mickey's plan as I imagine he was going to drive her right to the auditorium from here but is temporarily subdued instead. This is unquestionably Mickey as we see that nasty gash on his forehead later on which could only have been caused by this crash. However, instead of unmasking him here, Sydney and Hallie choose to run away. I can't explain how this next part works because it just seems like Mickey got very lucky with timing and developed some sort of Jason Voorhees-esque teleportation powers. But the most logical explanation is that he came to, and as Sid and Hallie were arguing over going back or not, he slipped out the window, climbed over the wall, and made his way over to where Hallie was waiting, where he jumped out and stabbed her in the chest, giving Sidney an opportunity to get away. While this is all going down, Mrs. Loomis has followed Gail and Dewey to the School of Film Building, where she sets up Mickey's camcorder foot to be played for them. After baiting Dewey into running up to the projection booth, she sneaks out and around to hide behind Gail, where she then pops up on her. I've heard people say that Mickey was the one in the projection booth who then runs off to catch up with Sydney while Mrs. Loomis was hiding under the desk the whole time. But honestly, that just overcomplicates this scene way too much. So personally, I'm gonna say this was entirely Mrs. Loomis. If you ever had any doubts that this wasn't her, listen very carefully throughout the scene. Like the inclusion of Matthew Lillard's voice, inserted while chasing Sydney up the stairs in Scream 1, we can quite distinctly hear Laurie Metcalf several times here. First after diving over the desk, and then again after getting hit in the face with the telephone. She then chases Gail down the hall and into the sound recording studio, which gives Mrs. Loomis the honor of being the catalyst to one of my favorite chase scenes of the franchise. After Gail hides in the soundproof room, Mrs. Loomis attacks and stabs Dewey in the back, just as her son Billy had done. We can even hear what sounds like a ferocious feminine growl right after Dewey yells out to Gail through the microphone. <laughs> after several half-hearted attempts to break through the glass, Mrs. Loomis gives up on Gail and heads outside to wait for Mickey to call her at the pay phone where he presumably tells her how Sydney got away from him. This part of the movie always felt a bit contrived to me as luring Sydney to the theater seemed to be one big lucky break for the killers as all Sid had to do was run to the police or a busy street or campus dormitory and she would have been home free. But apparently all it took was for Mickey to light and sound up the auditorium as I presume Mrs. Loomis had instructed him to do before Gail rudely interrupted her and hung up on him. We don't see what happens next, but it can be assumed that before Gail got a hold of the police, Mrs. Loomis took her at gunpoint and led her to join up with Mickey, who by now would have had Sydney caged in, setting the stage for the climax. And from that point on, you know the rest. Let me know if you agree or disagree with that breakdown. Next time we'll be covering the anniversary massacre from Scream 4, where we'll do this all over again, but with Jill and Charlie. After that, we're gonna move on to some fun with the Halloween franchise. If you're looking for bonus content, including fan commentaries on the Scream franchise, you can check out my Patreon account right here. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I've been Zach Cherry, and I'll be right back.